Okay, so hi all. If you all didn't hear, uh, my name is Callie Dolphy, and I'm so excited to be presenting right now and to share a little bit of my story and the work that I currently do within the Fedora community. Um, I kind of wanted to start off with a small story from like the very, very beginning of my career, if you could call it that, that highlights what I value in a community and has led to be a major inspiration of my like choices professionally. Um, uh, after my freshman year of college, I got an internship. It wasn't anything shiny or fancy, but it was something. And because of that, I was so excited. Uh, I remember the very first day we had our like normal internship orientation. Um, we got sent off to go to the floors to go meet our manager. And I walked on the floor. It was a tech only floor looking, um, looking for my manager. And um, a random man walked up to me and was like, oh, are you one of the new interns? And looked me up and down. And I was like, yes, I was, I was still just excited to be there. I'm looking for my man. And I couldn't even finish my words before he looked at me and was like, sweetheart, you're lost. HR is on the second floor. Um, for the rest of the summer, I worked in a closet and my manager hardly speak to me. I wasn't really given any work. And the person I mainly reported to was counting down the days until they quit. While this obviously wasn't a perfect experience, it was formative in my career, and I realized what I prioritized in my work and communities, and kind of as a tone for me for this presentation, like prioritizing inclusion, passion from myself to my work, and also the people I surround myself with, and having meaningful work. And so with that, I'm Callie Dolphy, and I'm a part-time student right now at Boston University pursuing a joint master's and bachelor's degree in computer science. And I am interning for the open source program office as a machine learning data science intern. And we'll get to learn a little bit more about the work that I'm doing with that in a little bit. Um, so as the background of me, I, I feel like kind of where I came from and a lot of things more in my high school years really form where I am now. And so I was born and raised for the most part on a very small island on the coast of Texas. And yes, Texas does in fact have islands against all of the popular belief up here. Um, my parents work in the seafood industry and tech was very far from the focus of my town. Um, school really didn't come easy for me growing up academically or socially. I had a rough time learning how to combat my learning disabilities and others. But with that, I'm really thankful for the worth ethic that it forced me to develop at such a young age. Um, also during this time, I dove headfirst into the competitive softball field, which is a huge part of who I am. I spent most of my time as a kid either practicing softball or studying. With that, for some reason that I still don't understand, um, trying within the other trying for like kids in my town made you a target for vicious bullying it was the cool thing not to care and for somebody who like me who just wanted to try as hard as i could it whatever i did and see what happened it, it was very toxic um this was not the best environment and i'll be forever thankful that like my parents decided for my last two years of high school to move off the island and to go to a high school where I could get a much better education and be in an environment I could thrive in. Um, when I transferred to high schools, it changed my life for a lot of reasons, mainly my career trajectory. I signed up for a computer science class for no other reason than I heard it was an easy advanced credit class to boost your GPA. Little did I know I would meet people and a teacher that would change my life. The teacher of that course, his name is Mark Russell, ended up being my mentor and pushed me to reach my full potential in computer science and softball. His goal as a teacher was to push and mentor more women to go into computer science. Um, my freshman year of college, he actually passed away unexpectedly. And I know like he is looking down so excited for me doing this and talking about how I got here. Uh, Finishing up high school, I knew CS in this world was for me. Uh, it was the first time I actually done something in school where I didn't feel like I was climbing uphill. That this was for me and just how my brain worked. Um, my senior year of high school, I committed to Boston University to play softball, and I was so ready to go and experience a new world. 
little did I know that I'd only actually end up playing for one year. Um, during my freshman year, I actually broke a good number of my ribs pitching and ended up being medically ineligible. And in the weirdest way possible, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Leaving a world I always knew was terrifying, but it allowed for personal growth I couldn't have imagined. It, learned, it allowed me to learn how to love and be confident in myself, especially in an academic and professional setting. I'm a woman that is going to hold a large presence in a room and be heard. And for so long, I was told that was not okay. And <laughs> if you've seen me in meetings or in anything, that's just, I, I know it's who I am and how I want to navigate. I won't dim my light or my ideas to fit into a box generations prior to have created for me. And I will empower women and other non-binary folks around me to radiate their own energy in the workplace, nothing less and nothing different than what is uniquely theirs. When you finally have a chance to explore your interests, uh, your passions start to expose themselves like just naturally. Um, for me professionally, um, for me professionally, um, they focus on two major things. One is the pursuit of safe and secure cryptographic algorithms and standards. This is a little bit of a sidebar just about me. And this includes protecting people's personal data and advocating for legislation to hold companies um, accountable to a modern day standard. And the other one, which I'll be speaking a lot more about today, is discovering how to use data science and machine learning to help uplift our minority communities. Uh, through different courses, I was horrified to learn how data science and algorithms had been created and were not taken into account the potential biases of the data that trained them and the potential mali malicious uses for minorities. I feel like we all can relate in this sense of just like wanting to create to just like learn and figure things out and not realizing the impacts that could come from releasing that to the world. Um, this is like where I started to find where I can make my impacts on inclusion and where tech and social issues collided. My passions were there. I just didn't know at the time if there really existed a work environment where I could do this and be surrounded by others who shared the same passion. I wanted to work in a place where I could feel the passion radiating off the people I work with and the drive to make communities a better place. This transitions well to talk about the current work I'm doing involving the Fedora community. This past summer, I got the incredible opportunity to intern for the open source um, program office under Brian Prophet, um, and I'm lucky enough to have my uh, internship there extended through May. Um, going into it, I never would have dreamed I would have had the creative liberty um, to shape the focus of my pro project. Um, going into it, I knew that I was going to be working with sentiment analysis, um, but not really much more than that. Um, and with that, I got the opportunity to put actual actions behind my words of wanting to use data science to promote diversity and inclusion and hopefully make the space more welcoming at all. So now we can get into the project a little bit of what I've been working on for the past few months. Um, so going a little bit into why they wanted to focus on a uh, mailing list and the impacts on open source communities as a whole. Uh, these mailing lists have been a target for mining sentiment and emotions. This is a communication standard that for distributed open source communities everywhere. Um, and with that, sentiment can provide insight into community health and how each other are being treated and really can open up some questions is, is this a welcoming environment for all? And so, and with fostering like positive community health, you're making a stronger community and allowing for more people to have a space. And so originally my project looked a lot different than where it is now. Um, I came in and we had three major focuses. It was first was just on flagging like negative conversations and seeing if cinema analysis could be used to identify like overly negative conversations and notify community managers. Uh, the second focus was on identifying discriminatory language and is really where this project is taking place now. Um, is to see is, is there a way to identify members or 
emails that are engaging in discriminatory language that might be unwelcoming and push away people within our community. And then another thing that we were looking at originally with behavior around major releases is their trends and sentiment analysis into performance around community events like releases. And so during this time when I started the project, it was about it was back in uh, June, things socially in the world were starting to get very heated in looking at what had been my passion thus far. The second option really took my focus. I started to do more research on what the open source community looked like. And these statistics I'm about to talk about really made me be like, this is where this is needed. Um, this is from a su survey done by GitHub on open source users and developer. 95% of users and developer identify as male with only three identifying as female and one as non-binary. As well, there's only 16% that identify them as the minority within their respective country. And also only 7% identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or asexual. When you have your minority groups so small within communities, it makes you want to look at why is it and how can we change that? So from there, I had a completely updated focus for this project that I'm going and still working on now. Um, looking at trying to have to make, create hate speech and offensive language detection on mailing lists. Right now we're at the stage of modeling and looking to train multiple model, um, models to determine the best approach for detecting hate speech and offensive language. In the next stage, we're going to be turning this into a service that will automatically clean, the, um, clean emails, label emails, and notify managers of problematic um, emails and users. And this is going to be one of those things where it's not like a, you're flagged, it's done. It's going to be an open conversation to see what is happening within the community that's making this happen. And then the extension for this project is looking um, to use the model to determine if there's trends within these threads and figuring out why, these, why this is happening and what is allowing for our space to not be welcoming for all. And so... The majority of the beginning of my summer was actually spent on data cleaning, not the bright and shiny portions of machine learning that everyone likes to talk about. Uh, when I first got the data for um, the mailing list of the developers and users, the formatting of it was completely stripped of all of its HTML, which for a little bit of context is usually how people identify what text is actually relevant and what you're going to be wanting to use for sentiment analysis and what is just random and not really something that you would want to use. That all just got put into one place and I got to do with it what I would. Um, I actually want to show you all first kind of a little bit of the format. This up here is how my the emails first came in. I'm not going to lie that being an intern in a remote setting, I like actually remember this so vividly. I was in the middle of nowhere, Texas, and working on a pretty much a folding table and like first seeing all this the first time, I was like, what am I, I, where am I, what am I doing and how am I gonna get somewhere with this? And so, as you can see, there's a bunch of tags that really isn't what we're looking for. And there's also layers of different emails on top of one another. The only, like, if you look at this, the only text that we want is about two or three sentences. And whenever we are getting probably, I would, I would guess looking at this is about two or three different emails that are within the same thread. And so with that, a lot of trial and error came in and I used, ended up using four major tools to be able to get the data to the point where we can be doing some sentiment analysis work. Um, I actually I go back to this example to notice is that I started to pick up on that there was these tags, oops, these different tags at the beginning that were just a bunch of, I think it generated by the scraper and text that we weren't going to be wanting to use. So if I could identify what was the last word of these major chunks of unuseful data, I could cut that and start getting into more of the meat of what I'm working with. And so with that, I figured out what all of the common documentations for the beginnings of the emails was going to be used and use that as a cutting reference from the beginning or the end. And you had to kind of play with it a little bit to figure out, is this going to cut the email that we actually want or an email that is should be discarded completely? The next step was special character removal, which is something pretty similar to or common for uh, machine learning cleaning. 
And then the next two steps actually build a little bit upon each other. And it's something I'm actually pretty proud of coming up with. So once I got to a point with the cleaning that all I had left was just the different text of emails where I only wanted one of the blocks. There would be like maybe an email from earlier in the thread, maybe before and after. There was no formatic way of, of how it came out. But I decided to put all of the emails in chronological order and make a dictionary of all the threads so then they would all be identified from their subject line which one was coming from the same place and you'd have them in chronological order of all the ones that were together with that uh, i use that information to use a sequence matcher so by taking let's just say the fifth email in a thread i would compare it to the first second third and fourth and see if there was large chunks of similar of similar text from the ones prior if there was, I would use that to cut from the later email, so then it would, leave, it would leave only the text from the actual user at hand. And so this is a good example right here of how that worked. Of now this text was just, like I said, this is removing all the special characters, all of the nonsense, and just having like sentences. And we figured out, it, the algorithm figured out which ones had been seen before and used that large chunk to cut from the text that we were using. And so from there, getting a clean data set and ready to go into the next stage of modeling, uh, which we're at right now. The first step was actually creating a um, training and testing set. And this was something that I really wanted to do right. There wasn't an exactly any set that was similar to the, to the data that I had been using for online as much as I looked. So I knew that I needed to make my own set of labeled data to start training off of. With that, if I was the only person labeling, there'd be my own personal biases in it. And I'm really trying to navigate in this world differently than people in my past have and start making a new like era for data science and machine learning. And with that, I actually had about 10 to 20 different people uh, help label the data using definitions of hate speech and offensive language to navigate and so, it used, and so then by having a distributed amount of people at labeling the data to train off of, you're not going to get weighed down by one person, person's bias because let's face it, we all have them. And with that, I'm now at the stage of, create, of trying to figure out what is the best model um, for the Fedora mailing list. I decided that I wanted to try to compare about six different um, technique, um, machine learning techniques with four different data sets that I'd, been, I'd found. The emails one is the one that I created, and while it's applicable directly to the, and like pretty much similar to all the text that I have, it's not as large as these three other major data sets that, have been, that, that are being used for um, sentiment analysis all over the world. And so I'm going to, pretty much apply each of the tools with the different data sets and see which ones get the best results. I'm personally really excited to use this data set that's on um, emails with sexist language and trying to detect to see if there's anything there where we can try to detect um, sexist language um, within our mailing lists. And so, yeah, that's pretty much where we're at with our work and thank you very much. Hi. Wow. That was awesome. That, oops. Hold on. I don't mean to do that. Um, that is a ton of work and it is super impressive. The part where you're like patting yourself on the back. I'm going to also pat you on the back. That was awesome. I'm, I'm really excited to see, you know, what we can get out of this for Fedora. And um, it wasn't like, you know, we're not sure exactly where it's going to go, but Matthew and I kind of worked with Callie a little bit to, you know, think about what we might want to get out of there. And and stuff maybe that's not just about um, discriminatory language. Like, can we talk more or can we look at it and say, like, what are people talking about the most or um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot to be done with this kind of data that she's pulling and working with. So very cool. Okay, we have a question. Um, we have 15 plus years of traffic on the Fedora Devel mailing list. Will you be able to analyze this fightiness? No. <laughs> this over time? 
he also said fightiness. So yeah. Oh, that's fightiness was a different comment. So oh. yeah, can we analyze like a bunch of data or is it is it a lot of work to do that? No, so one of the great things is kind of the tools I was using to help clean is that all of the emails, you have a tag of exactly when the emails were sent. So I remember going through and starting to analyze the emails. The amount of emails that I have read from the Fedora mailing list from 2003 is, is more than anybody ever should, just trying to figure out how to, how to finick and fix things. But that is definitely in the scope, because I mean, like I said, every single email, we have a tag and start, and, while we're still training the algorithm, once we get to the point that we can start cutting up the set and being like, okay, let's look at 2003 through 2008 versus yeah. like the past 15, yeah. years, like five years. It would, looking at it would be really interesting to look at some trends. Like, you know, Fedora has a release every six months. So like the things maybe get more stressful before the release or, or is there just more activity or, um, yeah. You know, and we can we can kind of we can start making graphs and we can look at some of that stuff. So that's really cool. Um, one thing I thought that, it I think. Oh, go okay, ahead. Oh, no, one thing I noticed that's like interesting just about pet culture in general, when you start looking at emails back in 2003, sign offs were very common back then. And the nature of a lot of sign offs during that time is something that for me was shocking to just see there. I mean, the language that was used was concerning at times, if I'm being completely <laughs> honest. And so I'd be interested to see how it views to the overall culture of tech, of being that one thing I, always, I noticed just that everything was assumed to be, you were talking to men at all times. And that was the verbiage that was used or the example of the unknowing user was always the wife. And so it's just an interesting dynamic of how we communicate and how that changes. Sure. Sure, sure. Um, so I had kind of one of my one of the favorite parts about your story was the part about your mentor. Mm -hmm. um, I really think that mentors are, are such an important part of our life journeys, but especially when it comes to tech. And uh, my mentor was really the biggest reason besides the other friends that I made that I stayed with Fedora and I continued on here. And it was really great to have a woman as a mentor as well. Um, I know you said you had a, a high school um, teacher who was a man. Obviously, men can be great mentors too, but um, it, was, it was so fundamental in keeping me um, within Fedora. So I guess I want to ask, like, how did you foster that connection um, and how can you know other people kind of try to find those connections or do you feel like it just happened by chance and you're just totally lucky or did you put effort into making it happen yeah so there's a couple different layers to that so i like i said whenever i met um Mr. Ruxell, I was the new person in town i had just transferred high schools as a junior which zero out of 10 recommend to anybody. It was a great in the long run, but the TV show of eating lunch in, in the bathroom is those things are real. And so um, him and I automatically connected in the sense that he was also a part of the softball world. He had daughters and he had coached before. And so that was that was my identity for years. That's everyone knew me whenever I came in. And that's who I was. And so that's kind of what started the conversation between him and I and how he started to get to know me. And for me, I put a lot of the credit on him because his passion, he was super big in the NC WIT program. I don't know if you're f familiar, it's pretty much a woman in computer science um, scholarship that's big within um, high school students and college students. And he knew what my schedule was outside of class and he was like, you need to focus on trying to become a part of this community. Like this is a place for you and allowed me to take like a week or two off of our, like my actual schoolwork to be able to focus on applying and end up getting the scholarship. And that was like my first step into the CS world. And so in some ways I just consider myself incredibly lucky because he kind of, he saw the potential in me, even though I never had, I said he knew I I got in the class in the first place. I was I was looking for the GPA boost, 
and saw my potential and what I could be and was just like, you're going to do this. And so, like I said, I am so incredibly thankful for him and why at this point, like mentoring women into the CS world and just open source in general is some a huge part of my life, just yeah. extending his legacy and also figuring out like being on the mentoring side is so rewarding. Like I'm still figuring out my way, but getting to help and work with like um, high school and early um, college like students who are women. And like, I, I'm in a computer science club and at BU, I have a lot of like younger women who I've kind of helped and are hoping to get more into this world. And, and like I said, I, he changed my life and it's part of it you can find. I think part of it is natural and part of it you can seek it out. And so yeah. it's a little bit of both. I think the piece that I took from it was finding groups with similar interests. So, you know, beyond his involvement with tech. So for example, if you're in Fedora, if you're really passionate about like a niche part of Fedora or part of tech, there's probably other people who are also really into that. And if you're sharing a passion with them, they might be more like interested in mentoring you within the Fedora space. So I kind of like, that's how I kind of translated it to maybe how it might apply for Fedora, but um, yeah. if, if another, anyone else this, have um, any more questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Go yeah, ahead. there was another thing that I was going to say is that it kind of shows that it like for any like men who are in this is chat that showing that by opening and bringing a seat to the table and involving engagement, that is how we start to extend the diversity and, and opening up our community on, on, more, on from the gender stand standpoint right. that his focus was on i want women to get more like that was his he was that was his focus and i know so many people who are kind of in the same spectrum as me that i would have never been here and so that's how people who want to be involved and like want to make that impact and from bringing like more diverse people in that's i mean that's how we can help and what people honestly need to have a little bit of bringing more seats to the table because there is room. Right. So I have to, I'm just going to share one little story here. So when I went to my first flock in, oh gosh, it was in Prague. It was maybe five or it was six years ago, something like that. Um, there was maybe 10 women there. Maybe, you know, it was like a conference of like 200 people. And I had like moments where I felt uh, very out of, of place, you know, and I'll share more of my story there. But the point is, at the last flock that we had in Budapest, there was like 30 women there. So it might be happening slowly, but it's still happening within Fedora. And I think the point that you're making about men being mentors is really important because you know, women, we come into this space and we're like, oh man, we want to forge the way for more women. Let's mentor, you know, like I, I mentor actually, I'm doing an outreach mentorship, internship. Um, but like, I think we need them. We need men too, or it's going to happen at too slow of a rate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's an, it's everybody. It's, a, yeah. it needs to get involved. And one thing that I was kind of reflecting on when I was making this presentation I said, like, I know, like, my personal person, I am loud. I am a person that's going to hold a space in a room and be completely fine with that. And that's something that's almost required of women in field of tech. And that's something that I've really reflected on being like, okay, how do we change the tide that women in general can portray themselves and how they want to? Like, it's great that I'm the way I am, but not everyone should be required to be this loud and huge space in person. Like, I feel like whenever you're looking at women, if you're not, if you aren't that big standard, then people are going to overlook and push you aside, which is just, it's a huge yeah. problem that needs to be addressed. Yeah. So I think like, um, kind of what that made me think about is just like uh, approaching people in different ways and giving um, different ways of accessibility so that people don't aren't expected to all use this one method to do the thing because it's not going to work for everybody, you know, and that's, you know, and that, and when you say building a whole community, that means like a community that's open to being accessible, um, just on its, on, on face, 
that's like one of the things that we have as part of our foundation. So it's very cool. Um, well, thank you so much for presenting. I don't see any more questions in the chat. If you want to say anything more, wrap it up. You're welcome to. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. I almost forgot. I almost forgot. We're doing something very cool this year. We are going to make a video after this event, and we have written up a little script if you would like to participate. Sure, yeah, definitely. Okay, so this is recorded right now, so no, nothing to do except hang out right where you are. I'm gonna grab the text and put it in the chat. Um, so we made this really cool video <clears throat> for our conference in two summers ago now in Budapest, and we're gonna make something similar for this. So this is what it is over here. So we're having people speak the first part in their native language, which for you would be English. And then the second part in English. So the whole thing will be English for you, but we're happy to have that as well. So whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and read that out. Hi, my name is Kelly Dolphy and I am from the United States and I speak English. We are from different countries, we speak different languages, we are of different cultures but Fedora unites us with open source. Awesome. <laughs> Does she have to do it twice? <laughs> <laughs> Only if you want to do a second take. You I didn't say the I am a woman part. Oh, shoot. Okay. All right, let me That's do okay. Uh, yeah, let me, I want to redo it because I want to say that. I just didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Go ahead. There you go. Okay. So. Hi, my name is Callie Dolphy and I am from the United States. I am a woman and I speak English. We are from different countries. We speak different languages. We are of different cultures. But Fedora unites us with open source. Awesome. So yeah, we're gonna take this content and make a couple cool videos afterwards. So awesome thing. Yeah, I'm glad you could participate in this and yeah, let us know what you're doing with your work. We totally yes. want to know if you have some updates. Feel free to like come to me, but oh, I yeah. think the community might be interested in what you're working on. And if you ever write up a blog post or anything like the that. The first one's have, coming out actually soon. Well, we have a community blog and anyone with a fast account can go in there and submit a, a, a post for our blog. So that would make, I can send you the link actually. Oh, yeah, and perfect. Over on G -Chat. Yeah, because okay. we have like, I think my, the blog for, because we're doing actually a three part blog series on this project with um, redhot.next. I think it's what it, oh, it's going to be. Oh, look at you, fancy. <laughs> and so the first yeah, one is like in the review process and should be coming cool. out probably within the next few weeks. Well, maybe since you have that like official fancy one on Red Hat open. You could just link to that one yeah. and say, hey, Fedora community, I wanted to let you guys know I've been working on this. And if you wanted to get people involved, you could say, this is how you get involved, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just like more casual, but yes, especially if you have this like uh, super fish one <laughs> over on Red Hat open or next or whatever. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> Very cool. All right, I'm going to pop off. Thanks again. And for everybody else, it's the last session for today. So we'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Bye.